Hello and welcome everyone to NEMO's webinar on advancing trans inclusion for museums, galleries, archives and heritage organizations. We are really thrilled to see you all here and that you, just like us, share the belief that museums should be inclusive and welcoming to everyone. My name is Rebecca and my pronouns are she, her, and I work at the NEMO uh, network at NEMO, the network of European museum organizations. And just to mention a few of our main activities, uh, they include advocating for museums at EU level, providing training opportunities just like this one, and offering a platform for exchange for museums across Europe and beyond. We also conduct research and share knowledge. Which leads us today uh, to this webinar that we are hosting. So we have three members of the excellent team at the University of Leicester's Research Centre for Museums and Galleries in the UK. And they will introduce you to their recent guidance on trans-inclusive culture, together with Nicole from ICOM Italy. And I will let our four speakers introduce themselves uh, later on uh, as they step on this virtual stage of ours. And first, I would just like to say that when Nemo first heard about this guidance, we were so impressed that we decided to invite the team to deliver this webinar to further share the important content and help museums across Europe as they try as they strive towards uh, inclusion and uh, gain more confidence uh, in this topic. We were also very inspired to create uh, a similar guidance and similar ethical guidance to help European museums advance LGBTQIA plus inclusion in their institutions. Uh, and our guidance is in the making and you can look out, for, uh, look out for it this autumn when it will be published. So please keep an eye out. And finally, we hope to uh, see you at the NEMO European Museum Conference, Can We Talk? Museums Facing Polarization, where we will further discuss museums' vital role to build bridges and con contribute to a world that champions inclusion rather than polarization and hatred. So please do join us in November in Sibiu, Romania, to, next to other important topics, uh, explore how to build strong relationships with underrepresented groups and foster representation. At the end of this webinar, we will have a Q&A session with the speakers, so please do use the chat function to type down your questions uh, or share current challenges that you are working on at the minute. So we have turned on the live subtitles, and if you wish, you could turn them off using the cogwheel uh, and press turn off subtitles. And you can also move the subtitles around if you feel like they are in the way. And if you would have any issues with the subtitles or any other technical issues, do not hesitate to write in the chat and we will help you. And let me just add that unfortunately, this, uh, uh, the live captions do not work on mobile devices in case you were joining from your phone or similar. So that was it for me uh, at this minute. And I look forward to seeing you after a webinar when I return for the Q&A. So let's get started. And I will hand over to Richard and all of the other excellent team members that we have with us today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here today. And thank you to Rebecca and the NEMO team for inviting us to be part of the event today. Um, the presenters, uh, I'm going to start, but we're going to introduce ourselves before we get going. So my name is Richard Sandell. I'm one of the two co-directors of the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries here at the University of Leicester. My pronouns are he, him, um, and uh, an audio description for any visually impaired people joining us today. I'm a white man in my 50s wearing glasses. And I'm gonna hand now to EJ Scott to introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us. I'm EJ. I'm the curator of the Museum of Transology. My pronouns are he, they, and I'm a white man in my 50s, wearing black glasses, white shirt, red tie, navy blue jumper. Thanks, Richard. Over to Suzanne. Morning, everybody. Um, my name's Suzanne McLeod. I'm the other half of the co-directorship of the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester. And my pronouns are she, her. Um, and my visual description, I'm a white woman in my mid fifties with shoulder length, uh, fast graying brown hair. And I'll hand to Nicole, please. Thank you, Suzanne. 
morning to everybody. My name is Nicole Molazen, and I serve as the coordinator of the newly established I Committee Working Group on Gender and LGBTQ Rights. My pronouns are she, her, and my visual description is uh, I'm a white woman in my 30s, I have blonde hair, and I'm wearing a black glasses. Thank you, and back to, to Richard. Thanks, everyone. We'll um, get started, and um, we've got some slides to accompany our presentation, which today the presentation is in four main parts. So I'm going to begin by sharing a little bit of background to the Trans Inclusive Culture Guidance and wider project that it's part of. I'm going to hand to my colleague EJ, who's going to unpack the importance more broadly of trans inclusion, you know, what it means to trans communities, why it's so important for cultural organisations to take this work forward. I'm going to share some practice in this area. EJ, I'll hand to Suzanne, who's going to delve more deeply into the ethical framework that lies at the heart of the guidance, say a little bit more about how and why we created that framework and how it can be used. And then finally, Nicole is going to share her work with ICOM Italy's group on gender and LGBTQ plus rights, work that is working with the guidance and developing it, expanding it, enriching it, for the Italian context. So I'll begin first with a little bit of background. So uh, last year, early on in 2023, here in the Research Centre, we started to receive a growing number of inquiries from cultural organisations who were seeking help and advice around trans inclusion. So for example, they were asking, how can we build understanding and support for this work amongst our colleagues, amongst staff, and senior managers? How can we defend our organization's commitment to trans inclusion in the face of complaints or of protests? And how do we interpret and present stories in the collection that are linked to gender diversity and so on? So a whole range of questions um, and inquiries were coming to us. These inquiries were unfolding in a wider context of growing hostility towards trans people. Uh, across the UK, for example, there were reports of frightening increases in hate crime. And more widely, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Organi uh, Association, ILGA, in Europe, published its review of the human rights situation in the UK, noting the damaging effects of anti-trans rhetoric with ongoing hostile reporting in mainstream media. Again, in the UK, there had also been a recent case law, which now means that gender critical beliefs, so broadly the belief that sex is biologically determined, binary and immutable, those beliefs are now protected under the UK's Equality Act. And this change in the law was generating uncertainties and challenges for organisations that were really committed to taking forward trans inclusion, to being trans inclusive, um, I'm wondering how to take that work forward in an uncertain context. So recognising the need for clear and informed guidance, we launched an open online survey. We invited cultural organisations, not just in the UK, but inter internationally, to let us know where they needed support. So what kinds of issues were they dealing with? And we used the results of that online confidential survey to shape the guidance that followed. We brought together a team uh, with expertise in trans inclusion, but also in equality, legal and ethical expertise to work together to generate the guidance at pace. And in fact, over a period of just five months. As we were working on the guidance, news reports of museums and other organisations being caught up in controversies around trans inclusion began to appear. You can see just two examples of headlines here, one from the BBC reporting on um, a controversy at the Young Victoria and Albert Museum and the other headline from the UK's Museums Journal reporting on um, events at the People's History Museum in Manchester. These and other news stories really underscored for the team the urgency and the need for clarity and support in this area. So 
So we worked at great pace, but also with great care over the summer of last year. And the guidance itself was launched on the 7th of September. You can see here the contents page and I just wanted to highlight the sort of three main sections to give you a sense of how the guidance works. So firstly, we provide some clarity on the law and then also recognising that the law cannot and should not provide all of the answers. We developed an ethical framework, which you'll hear much more about in a minute. And then thirdly, we included scenarios. These were informed by our survey to show how the guidance could be brought to bear, how it could be used to navigate all sorts of different situations related to trans inclusion that cultural organisations were sharing with us and pointing to the need for help and assistance. The Trans Inclusive Culture was launched with the backing of more than 20 sector support organisations at a joyful event in central London last September. This, you can see the logos of those organisations on the right of your screen. And this visible, this explicit endorsement from across the cultural sector, including many mainstream organisations, these organisations that set standards, that advise and highlight good practice to thousands of museums, galleries, archives, and heritage organisations of all sorts. This visible commitment from those organisations was a really important integral part of the project and we made this part of the project to highlight the responsibility and the opportunities for all cultural organizations to advance trans inclusion as part of their core work and as part of their wider commitments to be inclusive for everyone and since that launch we have been overwhelmed with the reception um, over 7,000 people have accessed the guidance and the majority of those we know from an accompanying survey are using it to take forward and inform trans inclusion in their own practice and in their own organisations. I'm going to pass now to EJ to share the second part of our presentation. Thanks Richard. Right, we're going to think now about the importance of trans inclusion to the community and to the museum and heritage sector alike. My thinking around this is very much informed by the work of the Museum of Transology and the engagement with the project by the sector. It's the Museum of Transology is now the world's largest collection of material culture relating to trans, non-binary and intersex lives. And it's been crowdsourced from the community with handwritten tags that explain each object's significance. It was founded in 2014. We're approaching our 10 year anniversary exhibition. Not sure where time goes sometimes. Um, 2014 was uh, identified by my colleague Richard as the year we know as the trans tipping point. The moment when we really saw the media led trans panic explode that we still recognize today and that has barely subsided. Museums can make a difference to recalibrating the representation of gender non-conforming people globally. So I started collecting in response to this phenomenon, aware that we couldn't call trans people trans in the past, but we most certainly couldn't let the same institutions that persecuted gay men and lesbians in the past define what trans was going to mean today for tomorrow. So these would be the legal institutions, for example, that criminalised us historically, the media that has spectacularised our lives and bodies, the medical institutions that have pathologised us, the same, the same records that we use to explore LGB history today. Our trans history, first of all, needed to learn from the past, but we, it also needed very specifically to be made by us, about us and for us. So I think we need to pause here and, and question why for us? Well, because museums matter. Whether you feel fairly represented in them or not, whether you feel erased or hyper visible, whether they are sites of silence or violence, whatever your position or your positionality, neither stance detracts from the fact that museums make meaning. If you don't see yourselves reflected fairly 
or even unfairly if you've been erased in a museum, then, then you're rendered historically homeless. Museums, you see, shape this society's sense of itself, holding an authority to inform us as to where we came from, how we got here, and how our people contributed to the world we live in today, and the place it is that we find ourselves in within it. But there's room in museums for us all. And given the chance to take part in telling our stories, despite the ostracization and being defined by engagement departments as hard to reach, when museums have opened the door to the trans community, the trans community's enthusiasm to participate, to participate provides evidence that actually, rather than being hard to reach, it appears that we've hardly ever been reached effectively before. So when I started collecting, for example, rather than having to convince people to find an object that we find meaning, that they found meaningful, it appeared that they had already been collecting these objects and that there was a vibrant culture of collecting already at work. People had been saving the stories about themselves and the material evidence of their gender trajectories. So with this vibrant culture of collecting already in existence and the generosity with which people came forward to donate it to the MOT, we demonstrated a yearning for them to belong that certainly an enthusiasm that there was certainly an enthusiasm for museums to welcome them in and to share their stories. And it's reflected in this tag here, our history is valuable, we are important, said one of the visitors to the exhibition. We can see that the museum and heritage sector have shown an abundance of enthusiasm for engaging with the process of developing and implementing the trans inclusive culture guidance. And it's clear that the workers in the sector are not in actual fact in a panic about trans people. They're in a panic, a trans panic about doing the right thing and the best job that they can, whilst maintaining confidence in the ethics behind their commitment to be inclusive spaces for everyone. And Richard's mentioned that we were overwhelmed with more than a thousand responses to the survey asking for letting us know about the kind of advice they were looking for. The approaches taken by museums to engage with trans inclusive practice range from engaging with their own collections to community collecting to organizational culture. Small and large, regional and national museums are now employing trans inclusive culture with work facing inwards to employees as well as outwards to audiences with increasing confidence. They are embracing a variety of methodologies that center the trans inclusive guidance's ethical framework for advancing trans inclusive culture within their organizations. And this work from the National Portrait Gallery shows an acquisition of Wolfgang Tillman's photographic portrait of non-binary poet, spoken word artist and playwright and all-round legend Kay Tempest. Um, so on one end we've got this kind of work to the work that was done by 15 museums, libraries and archives from across the UK in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England who hosted Trans Days of collecting to build permanent collections of their own using uh, their own Museum of Transology permanent collections using crowdsourced materials that communities brought to them on the day. So I think that overall we can see that this kind of work helps to illustrate how trans inclusion is not, as is often portrayed by the media, a radical diversive ideology nor is it part of a political or individual agenda, but rather it's a core part of the everyday work we do as ethical and inclusive organisations. And it's also good practice. And just to finish with an example, this is feedback that we got from um, the curator at Hastings Museum and Art Gallery, Oriana Kalman, where she talks about the fact that they learnt so much from the process of community collecting and saw how much it meant to the community that in actual fact they're going to apply it to other stakeholders and community groups as a result. They say that we felt this was such a successful experience for everyone involved and feel that it spoke so much truly of our ethos as a museum and the goals of where we want to be as a true community museum. Trans liberation's liberation for all and trans inclusive practice is good practice. So over to you, Suzanne, to continue with the uh, ethical framework. Thank you. Thank you. 
That's great. Thank you, EJ. So as Richard said at the um, start of this presentation, the Trans Inclusive Culture Guidance brings together law and ethics in order to provide clarity and practical advice around generating and sustaining a trans inclusive organisational culture. So in addition to precision around the law, it sets out an ethical framework and we'll take a look at that ethical framework in a, in a moment. First, though, it's quite helpful to just pause for a moment and think about what an ethical framework is and why it can be so helpful um, to our work. Um, so I'll just run through a few key points which are incredibly helpful as you begin to pick up the framework and utilise it in your day to day practice. So what does an ethical framework do? Well, it sets out key principles and ethical coordinates at that very top level to guide our work and decision making, both for teams and for individuals. The whole point of it is to build ethical thinking into our everyday practice. It brings leading edge scholarship and varied research led professional and lived expertise into dialogue with the practice and realities of our organisations. So all of that expertise that's fed into the ethical framework is there with you all the time. You can hold that up against the organisation. They're often produced through a democratic process of joint learning that can itself drive organisational change. And of course, they're not a formula. They're there to help you through a process of building clarity, confidence and shared understanding. They can deepen our work and bring that scholarship and precision uh, to our work in ways that are incredibly practical. Importantly, they support institutional ownership of deep ethical thinking. So taking the emphasis off and ensuring organisations aren't reliant on the personal ethics and values of individuals. And I think we could probably all relate to that. And importantly, they provide a lasting legacy and a record of that deep ethical thinking and practice that's of great value to organisations as they move their social justice work forward. So the ethical framework in the guidance is organised under four key questions that enable you to drive trans inclusive practices into your work. And you can see those questions set out here on the slide. So how can we develop trans inclusive displays, events and public programming? How can we work with trans communities to advance trans inclusion? How can we generate trans inclusive organisational culture? And how can we provide a warm welcome to and ensure the safety of trans visitors? So each question is then unpacked in the guidance through a series of ethical coordinates. So these are deeply practical principles that you can apply gradually um, and build up uh, as sustained aspects of your ethical practice. And you can see here one of the four frameworks around that central question of how can we generate a trans inclusive organisational culture. So if we just go in a little bit uh, closer on that particular aspect of the framework and you can see how the coordinates um, related to how we build trans inclusive organisational culture, how they include that very clear guidance. So, for example, by recognising the use of correct, so that's an individual's stated pronouns as central to a respectful, dignified and caring workplace. And then, of course, linked to that by providing non-gendered uniforms and using gender inclusive language in all communications. So you can see deeply practical, very straightforward things that we can apply uh, in our work. And then reflecting the complexity of organisations and the range of personal values that will exist 
across museum teams. The coordinates also relate to each other and often they exist in tension. They're, they're there to purposefully make us question how we're doing things and think together deeply about how we take our work forward. So, for example, this particular aspect of the framework also includes by establishing the ground rules for respectful working and caring relationships within your organisation. So recognising that there are steps, active, proactive steps that we have to take in order to ensure uh, that our culture is inclusive and safe. You can also see there by ensuring the organisation's equity and inclusion policies address trans inclusion alongside wider commitments to inclusion. So being explicit about your organisation's commitments and policies. You'll also notice that it asks questions about who you're partnering with and on the earlier slide, how you're working to remain educated and knowledgeable. So these frameworks can also give us a challenge. They can make us insist that we're doing the work, we're putting the effort in to ensuring that we're knowledgeable and we have all of the information and expertise that we need. And importantly, that we're partnering, we're working with colleagues, people with lived experience who can bring in the expertise that we may not have. The key with any ethical framework is to pick it up and start working through the coordinates and go in somewhere where you're able to start building up your networks and practices um, and importantly, making space and time to sustain the work. Finally, the guidance includes a whole series of scenarios built directly from the experiences and observations of a wide, ranging, uh, wide range of museum and cultural professionals. And you can see just a sample of those scenarios, the questions that are asked. Uh, in the guidance. So, for example, can we use the term trans to refer to people in the past? Um, and there's a, you know, we, we draw in uh, all sorts of expertise to give really full detailed answers to these questions. You can see a scenario there, you know, a member of staff continually refuses to use the correct pro pronouns. Again, we draw in the relevant exp expertise to give a really full answer. And the scenarios also deal with some of those big misunderstandings that circulate. So you can see there, for example, top right, a scenario where uh, colleagues are confusing um, the ambitions to advance inclusion for particular groups. They're confusing that and seeing that almost as something that then takes away from another group's rights. And so again, full and detailed answers are given so that you can then work with your teams to educate them um, and help them understand uh, that actually advancing the rights of one group in no way undermines or takes away from the rights of another. So I'm now gonna pass over to Nicole. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And I'd like to expand on how and why within ICOM Italy we're working with the trans inclusive guidelines. And to begin, I'd like to say a few words about the social political climate we currently find ourselves in. According to ILGA, which is an organization that monitors the state of LGBT rights in Europe, Italy ranks among the lowest EU member states on its rainbow map. And in addition to this, since the election of the current government in 2022, rainbow families and trans individuals are at the greater risk of discrimination. And it is within this troubling political climate where we see anti-gender sentiments and far-right movements gaining support across Europe and beyond that our working group uh, within ICOM Italy has deemed it more important than ever to prioritize trans equity. We see that the non-binary nature of gender poses cultural professionals with dilemmas and questions such as what is the appropriate language to use, what should inclusive toilets look like, and we found that the trans inclusive guidelines helped us addressing these questions and many more by offering a comprehensive ethical framework. Despite 
Uh, the cultural differences, the guidelines hold value and relevance in our context as well, as they address a full range of concern from issues faced by front house staff to curation and internal processes behind the scenes. And as they stand, the guidelines are offering us valuable insights on how to address the challenges that we face. But also within our community, we've had the opportunity to translate them into Italian and to implement some context specific content. And this work is still in progress, and I will outline the process we have embarked on, as well as some of the insights that we have gathered. So we plan in our translation to maintain the ethical framework in its entirety, because it's response to the characteristics of our context as well, but we aim to implement a section on language, specifically how to address the fluidity of gender in a language that, unlike English, is grammatically shaped by a gender binary. And we will also implement a section on legal strategies. We, are conduct we have been conducting in-depth interviews with community members to assess the specific needs of Italian trans individuals and found strong enthusiasm for the projects. These interviews generated many important insights, such as the barriers that trans people face when accessing cultural spaces. For example, navigating ticketing systems that require a name matching the ID card, along with the choice of Mr. or Mr. title, creates significant barriers that even prevents many trans people from even considering visiting a museum or enrolling in a library membership. And we are also working uh, with a legal expert because to many countries in the EU, in Italy, we are confronted with a legislative gap, which is the lack of national level and anti-discrimination laws that cover sexual orientation and gender identity. So we are devising a strategy to cover this particular aspect. And as we move forward, we plan to see collaborations and partnership with trans advocacy groups and organizations. I'm going to share a few words on the insights that we're gathering from this process because they might hold relevance for other contexts as well. Firstly, the, the issue of language is more complex for gendered languages as we need to go beyond addressing pronoun requests. We're planning to advise on the use of emerging symbols in the Italian language, such as the asterisk or the schwa. However, we also recognize that it can be challenging to implement these symbols, especially in institutional documents that have legal value. So um, in such cases, we will recommend strategies that avoid the use of gendered words. And as we see that these approaches has, have already been taken forward by many universities. As I said, we are working with a lawyer, Roberta Parigiani, who is advising us on a strategy where each scenario will have specific norms and issues regulated either within the Italian civil code or guided by the European Union recommendations. We plan to reference international European policies as they help support in the rationale of this work in a context that lacks basic support for LGBT issues compared to many EU states. And also we see that cultural professionals are increasingly facing ethical dilemmas on how to address the topic of gender identity when working with schools and children, as these issues are often weaponized to fuel culture wars and foster anti-gender sentiments. So we are collaborating with our CMG to develop scenarios and provide ethical guidance specifically around this point, also informed by school protocols and Italian uh, legal frameworks. And a few final thoughts. Uh, as it is, the guideline has provided us with both inspiration and the framework to advocate for the advancement of trans equity through culture. Many of the trans advocates that we interviewed had not even imagined that this kind of work was possible in museums and they expressed that they would find it of immense value. Also, our process shows that even in a context that lacks basic legislation to protect trans lives, there are ways to support this work, working within existing norms and policies. And in Italy, where queering practices in museums are just emerging, addressing dilemmas around language or toilets can also serve as starting points for further actions towards LGBTQI plus inclusion. We are uh, benefiting from ICOM support in this, and this institutional setting also requires serious consideration around privilege, 
which is also why we want to co-create spaces for collaboration with trans individuals and groups, because we believe this is a crucial way to generally advance trans solidarity, which is an approach that can also be applied to projects of any scale. And most importantly, the collaboration with our CMG, which provided support to our group, has nurtured our hopes for, for transnational solidarity. So to conclude, I really wanted to emphasize the importance of crossing national borders in our thinking and practices um, around trans solidarity, particularly between countries that face uh, similar challenges as we all are within, within the EU. And given current polarization, this particular point around trans solidarity and thinking beyond national borders really seem to us more important than, than ever before. So thank you very much for staying with us and I will hand over to Rebecca. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all of our excellent speakers. We have now reached the Q&A uh, part of the webinar. So I would like to welcome all of the speakers back on the stage. Uh, so that we can all have a conversation and answer the questions. So Nicole, Suzanne, Richard, EJ, thanks for coming back. Lovely to see you again and uh, all gathered. Thank you so much for this uh, really important uh, webinar and topic. We're so happy that you took the time to share uh, your work and resource and um, courage <laughs> to work with this topic uh, with all of us. Um, I see that we already have a question uh, which I think everyone uh, is <laughs> would be uh, eager to know and it's the let me read it as with so many other things uh, you know little about there's a fear of contact how do you start involve the community of course how to convince my boss to take on this issue uh, and so on maybe we could first ask what would be the first step to take if an organization would like to as embark on this journey of increasing trust inclusion if they have not already? I think this is one we might all have some top tips around starting. So I will turn to all my colleagues to, for their thoughts on this. I'm going to begin with the really easy one, which is download the guidance and share it in your organisation. And I think there is something in that um, strategy of showing your colleagues um, the basis of the work um, as EJ helped to see it's kind of rooted in um, this idea that is one that is very comfortable for most museums that we should be inclusive that we're concerned with human rights and so on so here's a piece of work really deeply rooted in that not about an individual's personal agenda but deeply rooted in those big ideas that museums are comfortable with. So find that guidance and share it round to start to uh, begin a conversation with colleagues. EJ, do you have one you might share about how people could start? Sometimes it's quite helpful to work with something that's already on the LGBT cultural calendar. So if you can coordinate with a, a Pride event, for example, or a moment internationally that's happening that might have a burst of awareness, it brings forward the timeliness and the relevance of it on an international scale, but also locally, you can then engage with communities to help them perhaps start simple, a tour of the museum, you know, a welcome, a welcome to the museum that enables them to walk through the door confidently in the first instance, right through to the other end of the spectrum, a, a small collaborative project, rereading an object that already exists within the collection or requiring an object from the local community. And you can do this, you'll find reaching out to local community groups is met with such warmth and such excitement. I can't over overstate the enthusiasm we have found that communities uh, return in response to an invitation to actually come in when they feel like they're going to be safe and welcome. Suzanne, do you want to come and then we'll turn to Nicole, just any, any thoughts on the starting process? Yeah, I think both those, um, you know, picking up the guidance, 
socialising the guidance within your organisation and then um, ev everything outlined as EJ has just said. And I think maybe the another sort of component is to connect with other like-minded organisations and professionals. So, you know, one certainly organisations we've been working with, one of the key most helpful things that um, they've done, I think, is to uh, explore the work they're doing, learn about the work that other organisations are doing, so that you have some critical friends around you uh, who can support you as you know when when perhaps the harder conversations do come with that advice on on how to move forward Nicole. and yeah i was thinking like really practically that language can be an interesting domain for experimentation because language is present in the everyday and I don't mean just in, in museum labels or catalogs and, and formal print, printed books, but also in the language we use at the workplace as we write emails or communicate on social media. And there are so many ways that museums can start some experimentation by changing the language we use by adding pronouns or just by using a more uh, gender neutral or inclusive language. And I, I've seen organizations starting getting confidence just by experimenting with language and seeing that it takes most fundamentally a change of mindset, but daily practices can can help in gaining like uh, different mindset, but also the practicalities of, of embarking on a different process. I can um, just pick up those last practical ones as well. We have got plans to continue the works. We've been approached by a lot of museums saying this guidance is really helpful and is driving our work forward. And we've got some more questions and we'd like to kind of really push our practice to be right at the leading edge. We haven't got any uh, concrete details to share around that just yet, but it will come. And our contact details, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact details will be shared um, at the end um, by um, Rebecca. Back, back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, and thank you for already answering some of the questions that uh, were posted in the chat. I think mean, it's very nice what you said there, EJ, about making sure that the culture is safe uh, for everyone, because I think essentially that's what we would all like, right? That everyone feels safe in our museums. So that's why this uh, uh, guidance is so important. And then Susanne just wanted to connect to what you said with having friends around and a kind of network. And that's what we at Nemo really believe in as a network for European museums. And that, that's why we found it so important to also adapt the guidance uh, to a European context. Uh, but we, uh, we are having a more broader focus on the whole LGBTQIA plus uh, community. Um, and we really hope it will be well received uh, as well, just like the trans uh, guidance. I did see a question directed to Nicole in the chat, so I will just read it out. Uh, and it's concerning the work in schools and with children. And it says that, well, in the work in schools and with ch the children in relationship with the teachers and the people in these centers and with families, has it been easy? Thank you for this question. It is a really complex and important point. And my answer is inevitably shaped by my standpoint as a cultural professional based in the Italian context, which is a country where, unlike I think most countries in the EU, we don't even have sex ed uh, acknowledged or taken forward at the level of school curriculums. So for this reason, honestly, my experience, I've seen that teachers don't initially think that museums can be useful to address these issues, but when they have the chance to experience, for example, guided visits in the context of wider thematic approaches, the topic of gender or sexuality being addressed in museum display, they immediately recognize the value of having more artistic approaches or object-based approaches to these issues. So I see museums, the few museums that are embarking on this kind of projects in Italy needing to be very strategic as to how they address and promote these issues, for example, um, and an example that comes to mind is an institution that has worked with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, to address the topic of gender and through that being able to reach schools. And there, is, there are also anxieties because teachers feel they have to ask parents the permission for bringing children to museums when they uh, address these topics, but it's not true if parents have signed 
an agreement at the beginning of the school year around what content will be addressed during during this new curriculum. So I see that there are lots of uh, dilemmas and, and, and the museums perhaps need to be really strategic, but also mindful around how they go in answering this question. But I also see that there is potential and it's what we hope to incorporate in, in the guideline. Thank you. I guess we will learn more in the guideline when, once it's out, um, if one speaks Italian or can use a translating tool. I'm very excited to read it. Um, we do have a specific question about uh, the guidance um, that we are talking about today. And it is, if um, does the guidance also provide tips on how to make the database and online collection catalog more trans inclusive? more specifically for certain obsolete terms and keywords? Or do you guys have any tips of your own uh, on how we could get started on that? EJ, would you be able to help us out with this one? I feel like you're your expert. Mitch, this is one of my favorites. So I'm just going to give you a practical example, everybody. Um, and you can have a look on our Instagram, where you'll see the Museum of Transology Instagram, where you'll see us advertising the uh, Museum of Transology archiving late. The collection, it, we've got thousands of objects in the collection now, and they're held at the Bishopsgate Institute. Um, it's an institute in London that really specializes on community collections. And what we do is we have, they're so simple, but they're so amazing. We bring the community in, we bring some objects out, and we have designed, very much in keeping with the Collections Trust, an object entry form, like an object acquisition form. And we enable the community to sit down. They have pencils and tape measures and they sit down and they write out the keywords for the objects. And so the objects are reread through the community's language. But then we do another thing. We then ask them to fill out another object for the object that the other person has just written the form for. So two people write the words. And this way the community sees how even our own communities have a variety of descriptions and it helps them engage more deeply and more broadly with museum practice at large. I think it's really important to remember that this, this trans work is work about inclusivity. So it can be applied to both bringing the museum in, but taking the museum out to communities and demythologizing the practices that we engage with that, that create the stories that we tell. So there's work that can go both ways with this when we ask people to reread objects through their own language, but then to also reread their own interpretations through another member's eyes. Very good, thank you. Um, I noticed we have two questions concerning community and working with a community. So we could start with one of them, uh, which I find quite interesting. And it's the, the situation when you're working with a community and you're bringing them in and you're creating something together, but then the project might be over. Uh, and how could a museum or organization then maintain this community uh, relationship with the community in the long run? Um, and do the do they, uh, as in the community, sometimes feel unheard? Suzanne, do you have any opening thoughts? Uh, we might go to others as well, but around that ethics of uh, establishing, maintaining relationships with trans communities. Well, I think I think EJ uh, needs to come in on this. Uh, question really but I suppose you know it's the sort of it's a it's a question that gets asked with all work with communities doesn't it um, in that museums are not set up necessarily uh, for work to give time to work to sustain relationships so beyond beyond that I think sort of noting that is important in itself, isn't it? Because actually there's a need on lots of different fronts for a rethink on the way that we use our time and resources in museums, because clearly sustaining relationships matter, but there are different, there are different ways in which you can do that. And perhaps EJ, you could give a few really practical examples because it doesn't need to be 
uh, always at that intense level of, of working on a project, does it? A hundred percent. And it doesn't always have to be outwardly facing. I've found that the, the community is desperate to get inside museums and contribute to making a difference. They're willing to take on some of this work as, as a rewarding process unto itself. So the community can work across departments. You can have people sitting and scanning photographs from Pride events. You can have people labeling and building their own collections, but you can also have people learning out how to object wrap, whatever activity is going on in your museum, we can proactively engage the community to take part in. It doesn't have to always be trans-specific. This community is like any community, they want to be involved. So whatever active, don't try and always have to find such limited resources to engage, right? It's about taking the museum outside of the museum. So by that, I mean, proactively inviting a community group to let them know that we're doing these things in the museum that we could use a hand with at the moment. What we've also found is that a lot of particularly young people that have been interested in doing this kind of kind of help and community engagement, they appreciate a sober space outside the gay community, for example, but they also appreciate the skills building. They go on to study museum studies and they don't leave your museums and they come back knocking on the door wanting interviews for the next job you've got going. So you can think about this very long term about how this can involve education, how it can involve can involve outreach, how it can touch on your collections, how it can actually involve conservation. Every area of your, your museum is an area that you could welcome someone trans into. Thank you. I think that's a very excellent point also, that you can invite them into the museum and en engage with the community there and not only in outward facing activities, but really thoroughly ensure that the whole institution and museum organization um, deals with trans inclusion and inclusion of, of any group. I guess, but I think that's very important. And uh, the other question about community had to do with compensation. Like often when a museum reached out to any kind of community, they would assume or kind of not always assume, of course, but maybe they would like uh, to work with that community for free and get their knowledge without compensation. Um, maybe because of uh, poor resources and, and whatnot. But do you have any advice of how to overcome this challenge of uh, uh, compensating community members for their efforts. It's another familiar one, isn't it, around all sorts of communities. We do in the research centre, we do uh, work hard to recognise expertise that lives in a community as equitable, if not more valuable than other traditionally recognised forms of expertise. And we work hard to remunerate that fairly um, so I think you know when you think about things that you would ordinarily pay professionals for maybe running a training session and so on working really hard to identify resource that breaks down that hierarchy of different forms of expertise and does seek to remunerate fairly again at the same time we also the guidance is full of really simple straightforward low cost or no cost things you can do to begin to to present yourself uh, as an organization that's trans inclusive begin to open up uh recognition of the museum as a safe space for trans people to come in and simply visit and so on so i think there's lots of no cost and low cost steps to do and as ej says lots of communities want to be part of things and want to give and share and then where you can I also identify the need to uh, work ethically uh, and remunerate fairly. That's also something to keep in mind, too. Great. Thank you. Um, would you just like to remind people to if they would have any question or challenge that they're working on right now, that uh, this might be the moment to post it in the chat because we are soon to wrap up. So don't hesitate. And in the meantime, um, I would just also like, to, I mean, I, I have read the guidance. So I remember that there is a section about also how to ensure that um, 
uh, trans people working at the museum organization also feel uh, you know, respected and welcomed and included. And I think that's also really nice to just be reminded that we're not only working to ha to make the museum welcoming to visitors, but also make sure that the whole institution is, uh, organization is welcoming also within. I don't know if you want to add something about um, uh, how to make the workplace safer for any trans uh, museum professionals. Um. EJ, we're running out of time. I feel like you might um, take the floor for this one. Or, well, I think, I think right? the guidance, as you say, has lots of practical applications for how to do that. Um, but I think it's also sort of worth opening up the question a little bit because when we talk about trans inclusion, we're not just talking about including trans people. We're talking about including their families, their friends, their neighbourhoods. We're talking about museums serving their communities. So this needs to be done in the workplace and beyond out when we're engaging audiences. This is a lot bigger than a microcosm of hours. transness. So I think I think it's a maybe a really nice point to close on that we all live in communities with with a, a really beautiful landscape of diversity around us. And the more open we are to, to engaging with communities, the more likely we're in, we are to include people that we don't necessarily know are affected by this issue. So it's, it's really about making these spaces welcome because they teach us about the society we want to live in. And if we want to live in a safe, inclusive, loving society that's cohesive, then this is the kind of work that we can do in our sector that will spill out into the broader world. I could not agree more. And I think those were such nice closing words. So and there seems to be no more questions from our uh, audience. So I would like to take this moment to really thank you, all four of you for joining and for all of the participants for joining and um, clearly being interested in making sure that our museums, but also community is welcoming and safe for everyone. It's very, very nice to see. Uh, and unless any one of you, our speakers, have a final word to share, no, then I would say thank you so much and I hope to see you another moment. Yes, have a good day. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>